So thank yes. you. I hope, yeah, <laughs> that's the sound check. Hi, thank you all for coming and making the trek out of Diggy Palace. And I'm, I'm sure you're happy also to find a seat, but even more happy to find Anthony Horowitz here. Um, I mean, it's thank amazing you. that he came thank to you. DLF. Uh, and I have to admit that I asked the organizers, I said, knock whoever else is uh, uh, you know, doing the interview, I'm doing it. <laughs> So Anthony Horowitz is one of UK's most prolific writers. His Alex Rider series for young adults has sold, hold your breath, over 18 million copies. Uh, he's promised to share his royalties with me after this. And, <laughs> and his adult books include James Bond, Sherlock Holmes, the New York uh, Times best-selling Magpie Murders, and the word is murder. Uh, and the start of a, which is the start of a 10 part series, right? If the first book sells enough copies, <laughs> there'll, be 10, there'll be 10 more in the series, yes. He has also worked in film and television, and most na notably, he has created the BAFTA winning series Foil's War. Um, he is an OBE, and he, the New York Times has uh, pronounced him the most original and best spy kids author in the country of the century, no, not of the, just the country, of the century. And he started writing at the age of eight, so young people here, you better catch up. Um, and uh, in addition, he's also the writer and creator of the award-winning series, Foil's War, which I mentioned. And recently, the estate of the Arthur Conan Doyle uh, uh, announced that Horowitz was to be the writer of a new Sherlock Holmes novel, the first such effort to receive an official endorsement from them. And it's published, right? Yeah, I've actually done two Sherlock Holmes two books. Sherlock Holmes House of Silk yeah. and Moriarty. And Moriarty. And here he's going to be talking about all kinds of writing. Um, I have to first tell you, Anthony, that I met a young boy. I work a lot with young people. And I met a young boy in a school in Delhi, and I was asking all of them, who's your favorite writer? And one of them said, mentioned you. Well, so you asked all of them, and one of them said <laughs> me. Okay, <laughs> fine. Yeah. But he had a wonderful comment to make. He sa I sa I, and I always ask, why, what do you like about him? And he said that I like the fiendishness of the characters. And he said that you had to be as fiendish as you were in your writing, because he said your name was Anthony Horror Witch. Oh. <laughs> Have you ever had someone pronounce your name like that? No, nobody has ever called me fiendish before, um, <laughs> but I'll take, it as, I'll take it as a compliment. But it is funny that my name does uh, actually reflect my work, which is Horror Witz is horror, uh, is a lot of what I do. I've written many horror stories, right. and Witz in German is to joke, and I also do a lot of humor in my book. Right. So I'm always grateful that my father wasn't called Taylor, or I'd have ended up making clothes. <laughs> you know, so. so let's start at the very beginning, which we know is a very good place to start. Why spy stories? And what is it about crime that people find so sexy and attractive about spy and detective stories? Well, that's two very big questions, yeah. and two very different questions. Mm -hmm. Spies is one side of my work, and murder is another side of my work. Occasionally, they come together. Mm -hmm. but, but to start with spies, Alex Ryder was inspired by the James Bond films, pure and simple. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up in London, I was in a very horrible school, and I was very having a fairly unhappy childhood, a sort of very privileged family, lots of money, but sent to a very unpleasant boarding school. Mm. Any English people in the audience over the age of about 40 or 50 will know what I'm talking about, this sort of bizarre system we have in Britain where our parents pay an awful lot of money to make sure our children are psychologically destroyed <laughs> before they're 13 years old. And uh, I went to this school and uh, cold and bad food, and also England back in the 60s, the early sort of early, early to late 60s, was, was, you know, in many places, it was quite a sort of a dull country. And the great thing every single year for me was the James Bond films. This was, you know, this was another world. It was color, it was travel, it was women. I mean, you know, the, the, when I was uh, 10 years old, Dr. No, yeah. uh, for me, it was a fantastic moment when Ursula Andress in Dr. No comes out of the water. You remember wearing yes. that bikini? <laughs> yes. that, that was the day. <laughs> That was the day my voice broke. Uh, it was a big day for me. And, uh, 
Uh, so I was very hooked into the world of James Bond at yeah, an yeah. early age, and the books too, of course, I was reading. But the trouble was with the films, they got the, the, the character, especially when Roger Moore played him after Sean Connery, yeah. got older and older and older <laughs> until by, I think, Octopussy, the not, is that the last one, or View to a Kill? Yeah. At the end of that, Roger Moore yeah. is 57 years old. That's very old for a spy. You may remember that in that film, View yeah. to a Kill, the secret gadgets are concealed in his walking frame. And, uh, <laughs> uh, um, and I, I watched the film, and I had the light bulb moment that would change my life, uh -huh. which was, wouldn't it be great if James Bond was a teenager? Uh -huh. And that was the beginning of Stormbreaker and the beginning yeah. of my success as a writer and, uh, and uh, a, a decision that changed my life. Yeah. Wow. And I believe you were very fond of Tintin as well. Was, was that boy a detective? I, I know that you have almost an obsession with Tintin. Tintin is not a detective. Tintin is a writer. And actually, right. he was one of the He's reasons why I decided right? to become a writer. A yeah. And I am a journalist and do write mm -hmm. journalism. Um, I was not a clever boy. I was, I was a stupid child at my school. And um, <laughs> I was useless at almost every single subject. And I wasn't capable of reading serious books, which is why, incidentally, I want to say that I think it is so valuable for this festival to also acknowledge children's books and writers of popular fiction like myself amongst all the very serious and great writers right. who come here. Right. Thank you, because reading is a journey. And if you're, right. going to re if you're going to reach the heights of the mountains, yes. you have to begin in the foothills, which is where we are today. Uh, so um, so I, I am pleased that they do that. So for me, the first books I read were not big, serious books. They were Tintin. And mm. I fell in love with that character, and I've been to every single place that Tintin has visited in his books, one exception, mm. the moon. Couldn't get there. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I also loved, I loved the, the humor, I loved mm. the, the mix of adventure and uh, also jokes, yeah. the two coming together. Yeah. So there's danger, but then there's a laugh, which yeah. is also in my books. I also loved the secret passages in Tintin. Yeah. In Tintin books, there are fantastic secret passages. Um, in, uh, for example, uh, Black Island, the fireplace slides open and there's something behind it. My favorite one is the Cigars of Pharaoh, where there's a secret passage in a tree. Isn't that wonderful? But a tree <laughs> has a door that you can go. And I've always thought of, I, think, I always think of books in a funny way as being secret passages, and they open like a door and wow. let you into this secret wow. world. But in, and in my home in London, if you ever come to visit me, I have a secret passage in my house. Built, <laughs> when you go to my office, you go through a secret door up a staircase to get there. Um, so, so, so Tintin has been a, a big influence on my life. And it's funny that in my, in my writing, as a child, there were three books that I loved. James Bond, Sherlock Holmes, uh -huh. and Tintin. As an adult, I've written all three. Uh, <laughs> thank you. It's really called making your dreams come True. Oh, fantastic, yeah, yes. fantastic. And Stormbreaker and Scorpia, the two Alex Riders that I've read uh, so far. I'm going to go on to the others. You have nine more. Nine more. They're full of James Bond, like, um, you know, filled with bizarre villains, snazzy gizmos, and the fast pace. Uh, in fact, every essential ingredient of a Bond film, except the essential Bond women who you mentioned, there's pretty much every, unless they come later. Well, first of all, I do want to say, if I may yeah. jump in, Paro, first yeah. of all, the books are not meant to rip off James Bond. They no, were inspired no, no. by, but in fact, I, did, I worked very hard to make Alex Ryder very different from Bond. Modern children in Britain are not patriotic. They're not going to fight for the queen and country. Some right. will, of course, but largely most children are, are more now individual. They see their right. own life in a, in a smaller way. So Alex Ryder is, is not a patriot. And unlike James Bond, he doesn't enjoy being a spy. Yeah. He's very reluctant. And if I was to ask, to be asked what made the book successful, I've always said that it's his reluctance, the fact that he's manipulated. I think yeah. children today see adults often manipulating them, and they feel mistrustful of right. things they're told more and more. And in a mm. funny way, I think that is why the books yeah. took off. So Alex is not James Bond, but he is inspired by him. As to the sort of connections between that and, and the adult books, yeah. Uh, and the films, of course, you know, the violence levels have to be careful in the books. And I tend mm. not to write um, romance or, 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 or women into it. In the James Bond books, all the girls have um, extraordinary names. You know, there's Pussy Galore, Plenty O'Toole, uh, Tiffany Case, crazy names. In Alex, his, he has a girlfriend, and she does have a strange name too, but it's much more innocent. Her name is, his girlfriend is called Sabina 
pleasure, as in Sabina, pleasure meeting you. Uh, and uh, so that's where I got her name from. Um, uh, they're, they're not the same. But so you are, though, really careful of how much violence you're putting into the Alex writers, yet that's an essential ingredient of your book. So how do you, um, have you ever got into trouble, first of all, for the amount of violence? Only with my publisher. And my publisher, I always listen to my publisher, so when she crosses out stuff, I listen. We have violent arguments, but that's about <laughs> as far as it goes. I think it's interesting. I mean, violence, I have never had any trouble with violence in my books or from teachers, and I'm very aware that in order to reach a child audience, you have to make sure that the parents and the teachers and the librarians whose support is so vital if you're going to be successful as a children's writer, alienate the adults who won't reach the children. So you have to have a, a responsibility. I like violence, but always with a smile. I don't like, you know, Paro, I've just read your own book, which uh, is, is a brilliant book. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, no Guns at My Son's Funeral. I urge you to read it if you, if you haven't read it. It's very, very thought-provoking and interesting. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, you, are, you are a very great writer. But I could not write the sort of violence yeah. you write because it would be too shocking. Yeah. My violence is in a fantasy world, and I can get away with murder, yeah. literally, because... Uh, because it is so, the, 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 the rules of the world are so yeah. crazy. It's, it's, yeah. you know, it's not real. A 14 year old spy is yeah. a fantasy. Um, so I can't do the sort of torture scenes that, that you yeah. write, for example. Right. Yeah. Uh, but nor would I wish to. I, I like yeah. the violence always to have a smile. In my fa one of my favorite deaths in, in our Eagle Strike, um, yeah. Damien Cray, the chief villain, is pushed out of an aeroplane. Uh, it's actually Air Force One. And he's sucked into the, um, you know, the, the, the rotor, the engine, and he's minced up. And that, to me, is a pretty disgusting sort of way to die. But actually, when he's pushed out of the plane, he's on a tea trolley. And to me, that gives it its smile. The guys <laughs> are going, wee, and then crunch and splatter. <laughs> I see it as a joke, uh, rather than as something real, and as real violence. It's, it's really a, a, a new phrase, violence with a smile. Yes. <laughs> But there is so much real violence yeah, in the world, yeah. and people can be so cruel to each other mm -hmm. that the books cannot promote violence. The violence has got to be done in a, in a way yeah. that you can always understand that it's not real. Yeah. Uh, that's the thing. And all the books, you know, it says on one of my books that I've committed more murders than anybody in the world because of writing so many murder mysteries and Sherlock Holmes and Poirot on television and Foyle's War. And it's true, but, you know, these, are, these murders are all entertaining murders, right. not, 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 not the real thing. They're not the real Apart thing. Apart from one yeah. I don't talk yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> um, you've written uh, all these wonderful spies, you know, the, the, the great spies and the great detectives of the world, Poirot um, and uh, Sherlock Holmes and Bond. Uh, Bond. Do you have a favorite amongst them? Was one came easier to you than the well, others? All my writing comes easily to me, and I, this is my belief. I, I, when I say easily, I don't mean that I just sit there and knock it out. It's, mm. it, it, I think if writing is difficult, something has gone wrong. I think of writing and storytelling as being like a fast-flowing river, that when you read a book, mm. or when you write a book, and I think the two experiences are actually are, are, are much more similar mm -hmm. than people acknowledge, mm. It's like immersing yourself in a very fast-flowing river. Yeah. And all you can do is paddle to keep up and to, and to stay afloat and to go where the, the current takes you. And I think that if you find yourself floundering or if you're sort of choking or gasping, something has gone wrong. So for me, easy and difficult are words I don't tend to, right. to use. Right. Um, that said, I found Bond more complicated to write and oh. required more thought okay. because it's a, than Sherlock Holmes. And of the two characters, Sherlock Holmes was more pleasant to write. But that's only because Bond is, is such a dark character. I mean, he's a, you know, it, it's one of the problems I have writing Bond is how do you write James Bond for an audience now in the age post Weinstein? Uh, exactly. I'm sorry to bring him into this conversation, yes. but you think about it. The attitude, I don't know if it is happening in India, but right now in Great Britain and other European countries, there has been a sea change in the way yeah. r men relate to women and how that relationship is seen in both literature and in life. And I have to say it's very welcome. I mean, it is long due, it's long been time for us to re-acknowledge the role of women in life and in the workplace yeah. and to understand that yeah. the sort of behavior that was acceptable even a year ago yeah 
is not acceptable now. Exactly. And I know if you've been reading in the papers, but it had to happen. Exactly. But uh, when you come to James Bond, who is a predator, who sees women as objects, if I say to you the, the phrase, they talked about who's going to be the next Bond girl in a film. Mm. But now, those two words, Bond girl, I would never use them because they have already become mm. pejorative. Yeah. They're already yeah. somehow shocking. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very interesting and difficult. There, I've said the word, the D word. It is difficult with Bond to square the circle, to be true to the character of a misogynistic, yeah. slightly racist, yeah. homophobic, yeah. very cold-blooded character how to make that character attractive to a modern audience, mm. but still stay true to what Ian Fleming created. Yeah, That's the difficulty. Exactly. That's the challenge. But Sherlock so Holmes is easier is e because yeah. he's Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. We, we know yeah. him in, yeah. and he yeah. hasn't changed over the centuries. Well, this, this was actually my very next question was about, do you feel sometimes that James Bond is dated and archaic in exactly the ways that no, you No, I don't mentioned. feel that. I don't feel that because is, is Othello outdated? Is, um, you know, is, is the Merchant of Venice, the Shylock? Mm -hmm. Shylock mm -hmm. is a sort of a racist portrayal of a character in Shakespeare, and you could say that he only belongs to the 17th century. Right. The genius of Shakespeare is that his characters are as relevant now yeah. in a different way yeah. as when they were written. Bond and Sherlock Holmes are equally iconic figures, and what is great about them both is oh. that every age that encounters them draws pleasure from them right. without any of this baggage. They seem to work. It's like, you know, you can make James Bond, Sean Connery. You can then go to Roger Moore, heaven help us. Uh, or you can go to <laughs> Timothy Dalton or George Lassenby yeah. or now Daniel Craig. Yeah. And the films are still right. huge. And one, yeah. in, one, one person in 10 around the world has seen a Bond film. Think about that. It's incredible how many people have gone to those films. And Bond and, and Holmes, I can't think actually, maybe Harry Potter is the third. Yeah, yeah. How many characters are there in literature who have managed that? Generation after generation after generation returning to them. Yeah. That's what makes these books so yeah, extraordinary yeah. and so, so challenging to, yeah. to, uh, to, to follow. Um, just uh, since you ma mentioned Harry Potter, uh, do, you, do you think that there is a reason why so many of the younger characters uh, like Alex Ryder, are orphans? Well, so yes. Often? It's absolutely... In a, in a children's book, you start with the fact that it is impossible to have fun or to, advent or to have adventure while your parents are around. You have to, <laughs> you have to get rid of them. And the, I, it's true. And the, 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 the fastest way, I'm afraid, is to kill them. Chapter one, Oops, no where parents. Are, you where know, are my kids? Uh, <laughs> no, in books. In books. Um, my books for children are all about empowerment. At the end of the day, I think all... I'm not saying my books are great or the best, but I would say that if you want to write a lasting or a successful children's book, you have to empower your hero or your heroine. Sure. I love writing about a 14-year-old because a 14-year-old is sort of in a world of his own. I always call it he's an in-betweener, yeah. or she, if, mm -hmm. you're, if you're writing female her heroines. They're not... They're not children anymore. 14-year-olds are in many, many ways adults. Yeah. But they're not yet treated as adults. They're treated as children. So yeah. they're in between. And I yeah. love that fact that at 14, especially when I was 14, yeah. you're finding yourself. Yeah. And, and this is the time when so much influences you. Um, and therefore, in my books, what I do is I take the 14-year-old and I take away everything that the child relies on. No parents. They're dead. I mean, with Alex, no uncle. He's dead as well. Suddenly, no home, mm. nothing at all. In fact, I'm going to write a new... I have a new set of books I want to write, which has a, has a boy. I'll tell you the story very quickly, if I may. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's just This is yes. in my head, and it's just what I want to write. Here's a boy who is 14 years old. He lives in London. He is um, going to a nice school. He's got nice parents. They're alive. Yeah. He's got a brother and a sister. He's got friends. One day, he comes home to uh, his house, and there's a police car outside. And the police car say, we want to talk to you because the lady down the road has been robbed. Her house was burgled, and um, she was killed in the course of this burglary. And we have you on CCTV climbing into the house. Oh. The boy says, that's impossible. I never climbed into the house. So they show him the CCTV of him climbing over the wall into the house. Then they go into his bedroom and search the house, and they find jewelry from that house from oh. the old lady. The boy is saying to his mum and dad, I didn't do this. This is, this, is, this is a mistake. So they say, well, actually... 
we believe you were using this money, you, you stole the jewelry to get money to buy drugs. And this man here, they bring in a guy, is the local drug dealer, the biggest drug oh, dealer. Gosh. And he says, hi, I know this kid. Yeah, he's always buying from me. So when they do a blood test on this boy and they discover that he has got traces of some kind wow. of drug in his system. So wow. by the end of chapter one, this is only chapter one. By the end of chapter one, he is, he is arrested. His parents are shocked. His friends despise him. His teachers don't want to know. He loses wow. everything. And of course, he's innocent. All of this is a setup. For some reason, he doesn't know why. But now, he's on his own. He goes, he goes to court. He goes to prison. Now he's in prison. He meets a black kid. I want to, to, to have a, 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 a sort of a, a, a more, we were talking about cultural appropriation, you say. So I want to have a character who is not just your typical, you know, hero in a book. So he meets somebody from another ethnicity and another cultural background, and the two become friends. But there is nobody else who believes in him. And that is about empowerment. It's an, it's an adventure all about a boy who eventually, by the end of the third volume, it's a big book. It's going to be many 300,000 words. By the end of it, he saves the world, of course. But in doing so, more importantly, he empowers himself. That's what the story wow. is about. That's in my head wow. for next time. <laughs> I don't know when. I'm going to have to write it. I have so many books to write before then, but I, but I will do it. Well, that, that's really been fantastic to hear a story that hasn't yet been written. Most often, writers will be very cagey about it and not share it with so many people. Well, I'm always out nervous about sharing it, but I haven't told you yeah. who framed him and why, which is, of course, <laughs> the secret of the book. No, that, that was great fun. So, throughout your books, you've got the most diabolical villains. And um, how do you invent them and vest them with evil? And do you have top five villains? I won't give you my top five villains because that would, that, would, that would take too long. But I like very much um, Julia Rothman in Scorpia is a good villain uh, because um, she's named after the cigarette. It's, I don't put many messages into my books, but one of the messages I do tell young people is, is don't smoke, it'll kill you. So I came, named the character Julia Rothman. And I like her because it's unusual in a kid's book to have a female mm. villain. Quite difficult in Sydney because when you come to the murder, I don't quite know why, but as a man I find it harder to, to, to kill a female character, mm. uh, the smile went. Although actually it was quite funny in the end, a hot air balloon falls on her. So it was, it was sort of at least, it was, un, it was, it was, it was bigger than life. Um, I liked very much the villain in um, Stormbreaker. Um, yeah. uh, Herod Sale was my first villain. Uh, I, I don't know, I mean, uh, where do they come from? Um, I base them on real people. Yeah. I often take people and they give me an idea for, a, I think that even if you're writing fantasy, you need to have an underlying truth inside yeah. the book. Yeah. If it's all yeah. ridiculous, nobody yeah. will read it. Yeah. So I always started with newspapers. Every single one of the Alex Ryder books has been based on a newspaper story that I've read somewhere, oh. which I then turn around and I draw characters. Yeah. Often they're not bad people, but they're people I imagine might be bad and I use them in the books. Oh, wow. So, you know, I, I, I could easily, having met you, yeah. turn you into the villain of a book. <laughs> Excellent. You know, but only because, you seem, happy to be only because you seem so nice. It would be a big surprise <laughs> in the last chapter when you were revealed to be the person with the pussycat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you have wonderful gizmos, so many of them that I wished I had. Uh, do you have a top five of the gizmos? Oh, again, I, I won't do top five. I just, I, my favorite gadgets, in the, there weren't yeah, yeah. going to be gadgets in the Alex Ryder books because Alex Ryder was based on James Bond and on the books of James Bond in particular. And actually, if you read the books of James Bond, there are no gadgets. That was an invention of the film, and oh. th they were brilliant to begin with, but as the films went on, and forgive me, it's not my job to criticize the James Bond films, I love them, but I did think the gadgets got a little bit out of hand, so that mm. by the time you get to an invisible mm. car in one of the later Bond films, mm. you've just lost touch with, yeah. with the sanity, really. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, my gadgets are, first of all, they have to be non-lethal, yeah. because by and large, Alex doesn't kill people. Right. A lot of people die in the books around him, but it's never his fault, or very seldom. Um, but um, the, the gadgets that I probably most like, therefore, are the insect cream he has in one of the books. Yes. It doesn't repel insects, it attracts insects, <laughs> so he smears it on a guard and the guard runs away chased by a thousand mosquitoes, <laughs> wasps, hornets and the rest of it, and that made me smile. I love the exploding earring that comes in point blank where you, it's in two parts and you pull it apart and then you turn it together. That came about because I was very keen on my sons when they were nine and ten getting their ears pierced, which they refused to do and we used to argue <laughs> about it. I always warned them and I'd come in one night into their bedroom with a hammer and a nail if they didn't do what I asked. I'm joking. But, uh, 
Uh, but it, that always made me laugh because yeah. it, it was came from my children. Yeah. And also my children had many of the gadgets in the book. My son, when he was 11, had um, acne, so he had acne cream. Yeah. And that's the first gadget in Stormbreak. Yeah. So that's where they come from. Yeah. It's that sort of thing. And I like, yeah. I like, sometimes I like the jokes that I make with the gadgets. Yeah. So in one of the books, Alex has some um, bubble gum. And if you chew it and stick it to a wall, it blows up. And that's OK as an idea. But the, what, what makes it makes me smile is the name of the gadget, Bubble 07. Uh, <laughs> so that's what, that's what yeah. gets me going. It's that, if that. Yeah. Wait, that, that now, now you get what it means, this violence with a smile. Right? That, um, one of my favorites was the uh, what, the starfish. No, it's not a starfish. It's a jellyfish. The jellyfish. Well, the jellyfish is not a yeah. gadget. The jellyfish. No, is it's a jellyfish. not a gadget. But the I, jellyfish is um, is a story I must tell as well because I use my f in in Stormbreaker. We're talking about Stormbreaker. This is the name of the thing. The um, Alex Ryder is at the uh, towards the end. The villain throws him into a tank with a giant Portuguese man of war jellyfish, Fizelia Fizelis in Latin, as I recall. And uh, he has to escape from that. And this came about because um, a lot of my writing is based on my own experiences with my children and my family. And my, I remember that, that Cassian, my younger son, who was, I think, at the time about nine, maybe 10 years old, we were on a holiday, and he was stung. I have to say, I use my children all the time in my books, <laughs> and so they're, they're used to this. Uh, my son was stung um, by a jellyfish when we were on a holiday in, I think, Mallorca. And he was lying there on the beach you know, writhing in great pain. I ran over to him with a notebook to say, tell me what it feels like. I've got to get this down. Uh, and, uh, and he said, Dad, you know, just, just get me a doctor. Anyway, um, uh, they're used to me. My sons are used to me. Uh, but I remembered that, and yeah. I put the jellyfish yeah. from that incident into the book. And of course, you know that somebody's going to die uh, with, you know, because of that jellyfish, which just slowly comes and embraces. That's right, of course. Ah, it's, it's you, can't, you can't put a jellyfish into a book without having one of the bad guys end up smothered by a jellyfish. Yeah, so smothered so, by so that's what happens. Yes. So why don't we hear something from Stormbreaker? Well, actually, I'm just going to read the opening. I don't like to read very much from my work. I'm just going to read a, a tiny bit of the opening, just the first paragraph, because it's sort of, uh, there's a story attached to this. I'll, I'll read this to you. Um, this is just how the book opens. When the doorbell rings at three in the morning, it's never good news. Alex Ryder was woken by the first chime. His eyes flickered open, but for a moment he stayed completely still in his bed, lying on his back with his head resting on the pillow. He heard a bedroom door open and a creak of wood as somebody went downstairs. The bell rang a second time and he looked at the alarm clock glowing beside him. 3.02 a.m. There was a rattle as someone slid the security chain off the front door. He rolled out of bed and walked over to the open window, his bare feet pressing down on the carpet pile. The moonlight spilled onto his chest and shoulders. Alex was 14, already well-built with the body of an athlete. His hair, cut short apart from two thick strands hanging over his forehead, was fair. His eyes were brown and serious. For a moment, he stood silently, half hidden in the shadow, looking out. There was a police car parked outside. From his second floor window, Alex could see the black ID number on the roof and the caps of the two men who were standing in front of the door. Now, that's what I'm going to read. And before I, before I, I, I want to explain to you, if I may, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. why that, that piece of writing is very significant to me. Um, I wrote that in 1999. And um, I had written by then 10, 11 children's books. Mm -hmm. And none of them had been very successful. They did OK. Um, they sold maybe five to 10,000 copies a year. But my publisher is actually in this audience, and she'd be the first to say, but that's nowhere near enough. It's nowhere near good enough. I was incredibly lucky that my publishers, who were then Walker Books and still are for my children's books, supported me even though the sales figures did not merit it. And I'm afraid to say that in the modern age, in the age we live now, young writers will not be given that same chance. Yeah. If you don't sell more quite quickly, and again, my publisher might disagree with me later, but I think that nobody will be given the chance to succeed 10 times. I was. And my wife was, by now I was working in television, and my wife knew how frustrated I was. I was aware, this is incidentally before J.K. Rowling, so children's books were much, much less popular, much mm. less uh, mm. talked about than they are now. Mm. My wife said to me, look, you know, it's ridiculous, Anthony, you've got a job, you've got a career in television, why are you still writing these children's books? And I said to Jill, I think there's one more book in my head. 
is this idea I had, you remember five years ago when I went to see View to a Kill and I said, wouldn't it be great if Bond was a teenager? And she said, uh, she said, okay, give it a go, give it a go. So I did, and I wrote that first sentence, when the doorbell rings at three in the morning, it's never good news, and knew at once that this was a breakthrough book, that there was something different in it, mm. but it was actually going to, yeah. to sell more, and it did. Instead of 5,000, it sold 25,000, then 50 for the next one, 100, and so on and so forth. But what makes that so different from anything I've written before mm. is that it is true. It's all true. It's actually based on the phone call that I received, and forgive me oh. for sharing this with you, uh. at three in the morning when my father died. Oh. And that emotion, the emotion I brought to this mm. book, even though it's a fun book and, a seri uh, and not a serious book, mm. it added something that yeah. hadn't been in the yeah. earlier books, and that's yeah, something yeah, yeah. I think was truth, yeah. and that is why those books, yeah. I think, succeeded, whether the other ones haven't. And that's why I read that just to you now. That's the page and a half that changed my life. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Um, I, I uh, had done an interesting thing once I got the go-ahead from JLF that I would be in conversation with you. And I asked uh, on my Facebook page, I asked children to send in um, questions. And I said that the very best one, I will send a signed copy of one of your books. So for one, you have to sign a copy. But here's the question. You write for younger children in your Diamond Brothers books, for teens in Alex Ryder, and for adults with James Bond and others, uh, as well as for screen for adults. How do you, if at all, decide and go about writing for different groups? Anything that you keep in mind for one rather than for the other? Well, it's a very good question. I'm very mm. happy to send a signed copy for such an interesting question. Um, First of all, I think what, what defines my writing is not the differences, but the similarities. I love story. I, 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 yeah. I have this great love and, and, and feeling for sort of pace and, 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 and adventure. You know, I yeah. know, and, and so um, whether it's television, whether I'm writing for adults or for kids, whoever it is, that's the first and most important thing. It's about immersion. When I write something, I'm immersed in it. I live the yeah. adventure and the story. After I finish the first draft, that's when I begin to have to think a little bit yeah. about my audience. If it's for children, for example, well, there won't be any sort of adult stuff in there, particularly. I mean, you know, I, we've already discussed there won't be sort of, you know, male, female, emotional sort of stuff. I did actually, I must tell you a story that, that when I wrote um, one of my earlier kids, books, I, I, my younger son, Cassian, the one who was stung by the jellyfish, you have to get me back onto this question, I'm meandering, but <laughs> when the, my younger son who was stung by the jellyfish is my greatest critic. And just once, in one book, I wrote a sequence of real emotion between a boy and a girl when the boy gets his first kiss, aged 14, Alex Ryder and Sabina Pleasure. And I remember I wrote this, this thing. It was on Richmond Bridge, not the writing. The, the sequence was, not me. Uh, and I wrote this sequence, and Alex is kissing goodbye to Sabina. And the kiss lasts about one third of a page. And he describes all what a boy goes through when, when he has his first kiss. And, and my son, Cass, happened to come into my office that moment. He looked over my shoulder at the, at, at the page, and he read what I'd written. And he just said, he was nine years old, he said, Dad, if you publish that, I'm leaving home. Uh, and uh, <laughs> he was right. I put a red pen through it. So that's how it works. Yeah. In the second draft, when yeah. my publisher, yeah. when my editor, when my yeah. children read the mm. things, I begin to think again. But as I'm writing, I'm also instinctive. I won't use names that are difficult for a child to read. Mm -hmm. Literacy levels in Britain are, are complicated, and it's difficult to work out what children are reading and what mm -hmm. children aren't. But I do know that my books, the Alex Ryder books, have been very helpful in getting reluctant readers into books. Yeah. And I would think that if you have a, a, a complicated name or a, a word which has got five syllables in it, there will be some readers yeah. for whom that becomes an obstacle. And I'm terrified that that kid may give up. So often, I will just mm. take out a five-syllable word and use a, a three-syllable mm. word instead, or something a little simpler, a little less abstruse. I love language, and I love yeah. good language, yeah. but nonetheless, I don't like to have children struggling to sort of to read my things. Because I said, it's, it's the foothills right. we're in here. Yeah. We need to help them up into the mountains. So that's one of the differences I make. Uh, the question was really about the difference between writing children and yeah. adults. Between when you're doing Diamond Brothers, Alex Ryder, Sherlock Holmes. 
What? They, they, so as going as really your began, journey from foothills to mountains. It's really. all the same. It's all about writing stories. I have this feeling that readers, adult readers, and child children's readers are busy people. And therefore, my books have to work hard to keep them engaged. When I write television, this is what happened on Midsummer Murders, a TV show I used to work on. Midsummer Murders, I was so scared that people would leave at the advertising break that as soon as the adverts came on television, people would get up, have a coffee, go to bed, whatever. But what I would tend to do is I used to put a murder before every single advertising break just to keep people interested. And then what happened was they brought in more and more advertising breaks, which is why, if you watch Midsummer Murders, there are now so many murders on the thing. Uh, in fact, I, I eventually gave up writing Midsummer Murders because I felt there was nobody left in Midsummer to murder. They'd all, they'd all been killed. Um, and, uh, um, and this is how I write as well. It's always with the great fear that the child will get bored and move on to other things. When I talk, it's the same thing. Why do I talk so fast and keep moving around? It's so that people won't get up and go. That's how I write as well. So every <laughs> chapter has to end with a, with a cliffhanger. Yeah. Every, you don't have too much description. You, you get in there fast. Yeah. As I said at the beginning of this, there are writers here at this festival who have the leisure to write philosophy, to write great prose, to write great character insights, but that is not what yeah. I do. What yeah. I do in my books is adventure and, and action, and therefore yeah. I have to tailor the writing to that. Mm. Try to make the writing as good as yeah. possible, because I love literature and I love Jane Austen. I'm reading Mansfield Park at the moment, and every sentence in that book yeah. is like a little piece of poetry. It's, she's yeah. such a, she has such a wonderful ear for the sort of timbre of language. A timbre is a word I would not use in a children's book because they wouldn't know what it means. I'm not sure I do. But uh, <laughs> that, that, so that, that is how I do it. Is mm -hmm. that, have I answered the question? Yes, absolutely. Yes, thank you. And I'm going to do a bit of reading because oh. you said you didn't like to read. No, so I'm going, going to read it, from so. one of my favorite Anthony Horowitz books called The Word is Murder. And I'm going to read one of my very favorite passages which you're going to really laugh at too. Two days later, I was in Heon Wai. It's funny how many literary festivals there are all over the world. <laughs> there are some writers I know who actually don't write anymore. They just simply spend their time traveling from one shindig to the next. <laughs> I've wondered uh, how, I would, uh, how I would have managed if I'd been born with a stammer or a chronic shyness. The modern writer has to be, a, has to be able to perform. To be at, in, often in front of a huge audience, you said 2,000? Sometimes, yep, sometimes. Yep. It's almost like being a stand-up comedian, except that the questions never change, and you always end up telling the same jokes. <laughs> Whether it's crime in Harrogate, children's books in Bath, science fiction in Glasgow, or poetry, it feels as if there's a literary festival in every city, and I think, we also, uh, as Indians have become, tra uh, and Indian writers have become travelers from festival to festival. Um, so I was excited to be there talking to about 500 children on, um, on Hay on Wai uh, in a large tent. As usual, there was a scattering of adults too. People who knew my television writing will often come to my events and will happily sit through 40 minutes of Alex Ryder in order to talk about Foyle's war. <laughs> the session had gone well. The children had been lively and had asked some good questions. I'd managed to get in some stuff about Foyle. I was almost exactly 60 minutes in uh, and had received a signal to close things down when something strange happened. There was a woman sitting in the front row. At first, I'd taken her for a teacher or perhaps a librarian. She was very ordinary looking, about 40, round face, long fair hair, and glasses dangling from a chain around her neck. I noticed her because she seemed to be on her own, and also because she didn't seem particularly interested in anything I had to say. <laughs> she hadn't laughed at my jokes. I was afraid she might be a journalist. Newspapers often send reporters to author talks these days, and any joke you make, any unguarded moment, may be quoted out of context and used against you. So I was on my guard when she put her hand up and one of the attendants handed her the roving mic. I was wondering, she said, why is it that you always write fantasy? Why don't you write anything real? <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that the lady in the front row here has been charming throughout. <laughs> yeah, uh, 
You may be wondering instantly what it is, why it is that in a book which is a murder book, the word mm -hmm. is murder is a, is a whodunit murder mystery, yeah. I'm writing about being at a Hay on White festival and talking about myself. This is because this is a book is a very, I, for years publishers have asked me to, be write, to write whodunits. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't do it because I'm very nervous about, there are so many whodunits. And it, and the, I don't like writing books that are too formulaic. And I was trying to find a different way of writing a whodunit. And so I came up with a sort of, I think, an interesting construction, which is that there is a private detective, a man called Daniel Hawthorne, not the nicest of men, I have to say, who um, investigates um, a crime of a, a, an elderly lady who is murdered. And he is fictional and the murder he is, is fictional. He is completely yeah. fictional, and, yeah. she, and he is investigating a yeah. fictional murder of, a, of a, a lady who has just organized her own funeral and is then murdered about six hours later. And he has this idea, Hawthorne, that he needs to earn more money, so he will get a writer to write a book about him uh, and about his investigation, and then they'll go 50-50 on the money. And um, he approaches me, but he approaches the real me. So I'm in this book as a sort of, he's Holmes, I'm Watson, which is why I talk a little bit about um, my work going to Hay on Y festivals and all the rest yeah. of it. But, and Paro, this is here where I must be, ask you to be careful, what I'm writing in this book is a fictional version yeah. of me. Yeah. So it's, not in, it's sort of yeah. me. My wife is in this book. Actually, I, it's quite funny because she turns up at the end of the book. My wife, Jill, makes an appearance. And she read the book afterwards. And she, she said, Anthony, you know, in this sequence, she comes and visits me in hospital. She says, I'm so sort of hard and cruel. Why, why, why can't, you know, why have you done that? So I, I rewrote <laughs> that section. And if you read the book, the only truly fictional part of this book, really, is that section. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but, uh, but this is, the, and what is fun about the book is that it's both, it's called The Word is Murder, and it's both about, it's a, it's a whodunit, and, a, and I think a clever whodunit, and a fun whodunit, but it's also about the business of whodunits, and about writing. For years, I've wanted to write a book about writing. I've been writing myself, professionally, for 40-something years, so this is an opportunity to write in an entertaining way about what it's like yeah. to be a writer. And it's so interesting to have you as this, fictional real character and you you are doing the things in the book that you're actually doing in life well there's writing a, house of silk and there's uh, a, my yeah. favorite chapter in the book is a, is a sequence where i'm actually in a meeting and this really did happen sort of with two of the biggest filmmakers in the world steven spielberg and peter jackson and we're talking about the tintin film which i was working on briefly at that time 2013 and there's a knock on the door, and a fictional detective walks in and breaks up the meeting. So it's sort of, people, have, people have, who've read this book have later on been sort of trying to Google what's real and what, what? isn't. And, it's, and I don't think anyone's done this before, but sort yeah. of mixed. And to me, that's the good reason to write it, that it's actually something new and something it's not the same. Yeah. And it's also a good reason to read it. Uh, yes. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, there are going to be a lot of questions, so I said we should give more time to you guys to ask the questions. So we can start now. Okay, right at the back, and then the man in blue, the blue T-shirt there, right where you're there. Yeah, okay, let's go then, there. Yep, and then right at the back as well, please. If you could give the mic there. Yep. Yes. Yes. So yes, uh, yes. I'd like to start. Thank you. I, I, I actually enjoy reading your books, so I don't think it's restricted to children at all. Thank you. Actually, funnily enough, also children are reading these adult books, yeah. so it works both ways. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to ask, which I, I think you sort of got into, is is when, you, when you're designing a, or you're going to write a book, I get the sort of feeling that you, you might know where it's going, but not really. You talked about diving into a fast-running stream, but you still have to have some way of directing it. So, so that's part of it. Do, do you do that? Do, do, you, do you know where you're going yes. when you start? Uh, it works this way. I, I talk about the, the act of writing being spontaneous and being very... Um, much a rush like that, but actually you're quite correct to correct me because before I actually sit down and start that writing itself, that is to say with the pen in my hand, I always use a fountain pen and paper, before I do that, I have to know the entire book, particularly if the book is a whodunit where you're layering it with clues and everything else. And Magpie Murders, which is the last big murder mystery I wrote, which is an incredibly complicated double murder mystery, a uh, whodunit within a whodunit where it all connects together, couldn't have been written. I have, I have a notebook with something like 20 or 30 pages of notes and diagrams and structures. So when I'm writing the book, I know every single thing about the book. Just, and I often, when I'm talking in school, say I couldn't visit Jaipur without having a map of some sort of the city because how would I find you know, the, you know, the city palace or whatever it is I want to see? But, and this is the big but, because I know everything in the book, 
it is also possible to surprise myself. Mm -hmm. I'll reach a chapter where I think the character is going to behave in a certain way, and suddenly I'll have a better idea, and he'll go completely off-piste. Mm -hmm. And I'll go with that, but only because I know that I've gone over there now, but I, and I've got to be there, I can build a bridge back again because I know everything that's going to happen. And, and with the Alex Ryder books, it's often the case. I so enjoy the death of the villain but it becomes the reason to write the book. So I start at the end, and then it gives me the, I write so much, I need the impetus to get to the end, and knowing when I've got a really imaginative and fun death to finish off with, is something to say, get on with it and keep going. So I, you're quite correct. I structure very rigidly. Some writers don't. I was talking to Ian Rankin, who um, is, a, is a, a writer I admire very, very much, and he tells me he starts writing with absolutely no idea of what's gonna happen in the book. He just starts writing and sees where it goes. I couldn't work that way. I, I just go in and well, there you start are. writing. Mr. Horowitz, it's been a delightful conversation. Thank you very much. This is day three of the Jaipur Literature Festival, and I think for me it's just started now with Thank this you. brilliant talk. I remember that there was much rejoicing in Sherlockian circles around the world when the House of Silk came out, because Conan Doyle, of course, unfortunately isn't with us anymore, and you've continued that tradition. My question to you is about the character of Sherlock Holmes. Why is it that for so many of us, Sherlock Holmes is more real than the creator? With a lot of literary characters, there's a clear distinction between the author and the creation. But with Sherlock Holmes, you have people wanting to be him. Uh, there are people, including myself, for whom Holmes is more real than Conan Doyle. What is it about the magic of Conan Doyle's writing that does this? would love to hear your thoughts. Well, I don't really have a, a, a proper answer to the question. You asked me something I haven't been asked before, so I haven't got, as I said in that book, sort of, you know, the answer to, to some, some questions are new, and that's <laughs> one of them. Um, so let me say, first of all, the success of Sherlock Holmes, the reason why Sherlock Holmes is so loved, is partly to do with Dr. Watson. You can't think of Holmes or Watson without Holmes. Mm -hmm. It is Watson's admiration for Holmes and his great... Uh, humanizing of Holmes that brings him within our reach. And I always say that if you're going to talk about Sherlock Holmes, you have to talk about the two of them together. Because Holmes by himself is an unattractive character. He's unhygienic, he's, un he's aloof, he's untidy, he doesn't read books, he has no interest in art. He's many things. Uh, so, so that's one question, one reason. It is Watson who brings it in. Conan Doyle himself, of course, people probably haven't read biographies about him. He was himself an extraordinary and a fascinating man. The first man in the world commercially to ski. Uh, is one of the interesting things about Conan oh. Doyle. He was also a politician. He was out in the war. He worked on a whaling ship for a time. Uh, he, he, was, he, of course, eventually became a spiritualist, which rather ruined his work, I'm afraid. But he himself is a very, very rich man, but much more complex in some ways than Sherlock Holmes. Maybe Sherlock Holmes is so real to us because there is so little of him. There are only, after all, what is it, 58 short stories and four novellas? They're so limited in the material, and he has a wonderful name. Never underestimate the power of a name in a, in a book. For example, would you have been so enamored, do you think, of a book called The Tangled Skein, with two characters in it called Sherringford Holmes and Ormond Sacker? But those were the original names oh, and really? title of a study in Scarlet, the first Sherlock Holmes novella, and Sherlock Holmes became Sherringford Holmes, and Watson and uh, Ormond Sacker became Dr. Watson. And there was an exhibition in London a few years ago where I saw the manuscript, the type, typed up script, no, it was actually written by hand, sorry, where Doyle had crossed out Ormond Sacker and written Dr. Watson. Wow. It was a thrilling moment. It wow. partly answers your question. The name, these names, Harry Potter, Tintin, Moriarty, there's so little known about Moriarty. He's, you know, he appears in one story only out of all the collection, one story. He uh, is mentioned in two more, and yet everybody on the planet, he is the epitome of evil, and all because of his name, Moriarty. There's a wonderful story So you've told. written uh, Moriarty, no? I've written a book yes, called yes, Moriarty, yes, about yes, Moriarty, yes, 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 but I'm talking about Conan Doyle's right, Moriarty, not right, mine. Right, okay. There's a, I think the powers of names should not be underestimated, and that, I think, is part of the appeal. A small answer to a very interesting question. I'll, I'll have a better answer next time somebody asks me that. <laughs> uh, yes, somewhere in the middle. Uh, so yes, this, yes. Um, so before I say anything, can I just say how starstruck I am right now to be talking Oh, you're to very you. kind. Thank you. Uh, OK, so this is probably a question you've fielded a lot. But um, 
of all the of all your writing that we've mentioned today, we didn't go much into the horror side of what you've written. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Horror stories. Horror stories allow me to do things that other books don't, which is really to be quite horrible. And, to, and also to kill children, which I never ever do in my real stories, because I have a great fear. I think that there are things you can joke about, and you can, and you can, and, uh, you can have fun with in books, but the death of a child is never one of those things. Yeah. But except, and this is the exception in horror. Why? Because when you read a horror story, you expect it. You expect, it's called a horror story, and you expect something horrific to happen. And the deaths in these books, are always children who deserve it. I mean, that's uh, broadly speaking. I mean, no child really does. But in the stories, the context of the stories they do. And also, what I love about the writing horror is, is that I love pandering to that, that dark side of my mind and, and that sense that always, out of the corner of my eye, something horrible is happening. Um, and, and that's why I write those stories. But again, I never write real horror. I never write bloody horror. I don't like bloodshed and, and the real discussion of pain. Again, Paro, forgive me, but I said to you earlier, yeah. that torture sequence in the book of yours that I read really shook me. I mean, I yeah. could see why you wrote it, and I thought it was very, very well done, but I wouldn't have done it because I'm just not brave enough to, and it's just not in my, you know, your book is much more political and it has yeah. a significance. My book's entertainment. So horror to me is not about violence. It's not about bloodshed. It's not about pain. It's always still that word I've used all along this talk about fun and a smile. And I love horror stories about ordinary objects, about looking at something in such a way that, yeah. that you, you have to think about it again. I gave, a very, I gave an example at the last school I was talking to about a story I wrote about a mobile phone. And the mobile phone, the phone that goes dead. And just very quickly, a woman takes a phone call on her mobile phone. She's hit by lightning in itself, I think, quite entertaining, and uh, is killed. The phone is sold to somebody who then picks it up and they suddenly realize that they're getting phone calls from dead people. Mm. And to me, that just takes a very ordinary object, a mobile phone, we all got one, and turns it into something that gives you a shiver. So that's very briefly a sort of a quick tra travel through sort of the reasoning and the thinking behind horror. But it's just that the world, when it says horror on the cover, you can break rules that I wouldn't do in an Alex yeah. Ryder book or in an adult book or any other sort of book. Okay, just uh, one question here, this young boy since we haven't had any of the kids ask questions, and there's a young girl there, and then we're done. Yes, yes, yes. You stand up and just get the mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, if you can both give your questions, and then uh, Anthony will answer them. My friend told me that Point Blank is like a school. Yeah, ju just hold the mic a bit closer to your mouth. My friend told me that uh, Point Blank is a school, is it based after your, the school you went to, which you really hate? Which, which school are you talking about? Point your friends blank. Said, which, oh, point, point blank, blank, the school, no. People are, no. Point blank, which is a finishing school in Switzerland, is not the school I was sent to. I wrote no. about the school I was sent it, to earlier. Orley Farm in North London became gruesome Grange in a couple of books. <laughs> and the is, second question. No, oh, sorry. is the school in the book dedicated to the school from your, which you went to from your life? No, no, I've never dedicated a book to my old school. Absolutely not. On the contrary, <laughs> all the teachers who taught me at Orley Farm have appeared in my books, and I've killed every one of them. Uh, so, <laughs> the opposite. And your question. Yes. Uh, sir, first thing first, you are looking very good. Just a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. And my question is, like, will we ever get to read more about uh, uh, sorry, Alan Blunt and Mrs. Jones? Because there can't really be a character that we know nothing about. Uh, I have a collection of Alex Ryder's short stories coming out um, this year, and there's a little bit more, I think, about Mrs. Jones and Smithers. Alan Blunt is not mentioned. No, broadly speaking, I think that the, the focus of the Alex Ryder books is Alex and Jack, his, his housekeeper, and, and his friends. These are children's books, and I think children, my audience, sometimes I'm maybe not so interested in that. They're talking about turning the show books into a television series, and in the television series, the adult characters will appear more. Thank you. Um, I think we're out of time. Oh, Anthony, oh, this right. has been great fun, and Thank you you've very been much. a lovely Thank audience. You. <laughs> Thank you. Are you surprised sometimes? No, I said seven minutes. Of that. That's what I thought, but he's saying that. Gentlemen, Anthony Horowitz.
Thank you very much. Thank you. And the lovely Paduan. That's, that's right. Mr. Horowitz will you. sign your copies of the books, of his books, which you can also purchase at the book signing area in the back. We will be, we'll take 10 minutes before we